For those of you just joining us, this is part 2 of a collaborative episode with Fraser Kane of Universe Today. If you haven't already seen part 1, you should head over and start there first. Today we are looking at Kardashev 2 construction methods, and to make things even better, Fraser and I have been joined by artists Kevin Gill and Sergio Batero who are going to show you some visions of what some of these projects might look like. Now with no further ado, let's return to tips from Type 2 engineers, already in progress. In our last episode, we set up shades to block light from reaching our planets, and we did the same with dangerous radiation streaming from the Sun. We set up a concentrated magnetic shield at the Mars Sun L1 Lagrange point, which catches and redirects high energy particles. This protects the world from the Sun, but it does not prevent harmful cosmic rays which can come from any part of the sky. Our own planet Earth has a robust magnetosphere and is the main reason we have air to breathe and do not absorb dangerous radiation from the Sun in space. Places like Mars don't. For this purpose, we created artificial magnetospheres. We consider trying to get Mars core spinning fast and hot so that rapid spinning molten ferromagnetic materials would generate a protective magnetosphere, but that was too much effort. We didn't actually care what generated the magnetic field, we just wanted the magnetic field. In the end, we deployed a constellation of electromagnetic satellites around every world exposed to space. These satellites could do double duty, harvesting solar radiation and generating an artificial magnetosphere. Cosmic rays and radioactive particles from the Sun were captured and redirected safely away from the world, allowing us to roam freely on the surface. Once we'd acquired the resources to every world in the solar system, we began our next great engineering effort to move and dismantle the worlds themselves, to create the optimal configuration that gave us the most living space and the most usable energy we began the construction of our Dyson Swarm. Moving planets is almost impossible, but not completely impossible. How do you get all that energy to move a world without melting it? The orbital energy of Earth around the Sun is approximately 30 million trillion trillion joules. That's equal to all the energy the Sun puts out over a few months. Of course, the Sun is slowly warming up, and while estimates vary, it's generally accepted that in about a billion years, it will have warmed up enough that the Earth would be uninhabitable moving the Earth was inevitable. To move the Earth outward to counteract the increased solar luminosity, we needed to add orbital energy, a lot of energy. In part one, we discussed using gravity tractors and gravitational slingshots to slowly and steadily move objects around the solar system. This technique works at the largest scales too. A gravity tractor could slowly and steadily move an entire planet if he had enough time and fuel. But because we already had mastery of all the asteroids in the solar system, we put them into orbits that swept past worlds. Each gravitational slingshot gave or stole orbital momentum from the world, pushing it closer or further from the Sun. We also used orbital mirrors to bounce sunlight from the Sun, and with enough of them deflecting their light in the same general direction while maintaining an orbit around the planet, we could move worlds without touching them or heating them up from the light beams. With enough satellites to keep the net of gravitational force on the planet homogeneous, we didn't have to worry about tidal heating allowing us to move a planet far faster. In the future, we'll use a king-sized version of this to move the entire solar system using the star as the power source, called the Shkadoff Thruster. We'll push the Sun and every star we control into a constellation that matches our needs, but that's the problem our Type 3 civilization engineers will have to worry about. We always needed ice, for water, for fuel, and for air, and the outer solar system had all the ice we could ever need. We brought comets and other icy bodies in from the outer solar system to bring water to the planets we are terraforming, Mars, Venus, and the large moons of the solar system. Pushing ice is a tricky process, but the comet itself is the source of fuel, either liquid hydrogen and oxygen as propellants or using the hydrogen for a fusion torch drive. However, we have an alternative trick we can use. We just talked about using energy beams, focused sunlight, lasers, or microwave beams to push objects outward from the sun. You can also move inward by reflecting the beam off at an angle, removing orbital momentum. This lowers their orbit into the solar system. By setting up energy collectors on comets, we could beam power out to them, 
and use that energy to melt atoms into gas and accelerate them away with a magnetic field, just like an ion drive. This lets us take high strength lasers and microwave beams powered from the inner solar system and use it to track our comets inward. The propellant melted off the comets could carry away far more momentum than the energy beam added, though at the cost of losing some of your mass in the process. One by one we identified the icy bodies in the Kuiper Belt and Oort Cloud, installed an ice engine, and poured them inward, to the places we needed that water the most. The day-to-day energy for our civilization comes from the sun. Solar collectors power the machines, computers, and systems that make day-to-day life spanning the solar system possible. Just as the ancient Earth civilizations used hydrocarbons as a store of fuel, we depend on hydrogen. We use it for our rocket fuel to manufacture drinking water, and most importantly, for our fusion reactors. We always need more hydrogen. Fortunately, the solar system has provided us with vast repositories of hydrogen. The giant planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, all made up of at least 80% hydrogen but harvesting the planets for their hydrogen isn't without its challenges. For starters, the gravity on the surface of Jupiter is nearly 25 meters per second squared, which is nearly three times the surface gravity of Earth. On top of that, Jupiter's magnetosphere produces intense radiation fields through the entire system. You can't spend much time near Jupiter without receiving a lethal radiation dose. We deploy huge robotic scoopers to swoop down into Jupiter's gravity well, skim across the upper cloud tops, funneling in as much hydrogen as they can. Onboard compressors liquefy the hydrogen or refine it into more energy-dense metallic hydrogen. The fuel is then distributed across the solar system through the Interplanetary Transport Network. For Uranus and Neptune, where the gravity well is less extreme, we have permanent mining stations which float in the cloud tops, harvesting raw materials for return back to space. These factories are a huge improvement over the more expensive scoop ships. Smaller cargo ships ferry the deuterium, helium-3, and hydrogen up to orbit for an energy-hungry solar system. In order to construct our Dyson Swarm, we eventually needed to dismantle almost all the planets and moons in the solar system to provide raw materials to house countless people. This process has begun and we have a number of options. For some worlds, we plan to just keep mining and refining them with robotic factories until they are gone, but this can be quite time consuming and often we would rather do our refining and manufacturing elsewhere. Instead we have set up very large mass drivers running around the object to launch material towards its desired destination. To avoid building up angular momentum inside the shrinking mass of the planetoid, we run these giant cannons in both directions. This prevents it spinning so fast that it tears itself apart. There's very little gravity holding these objects together after all. But for the smaller objects that's actually just fine. When we want to disassemble a smaller asteroid or moon into rock and dirt for the inside of a cylinder habitat, we construct a cylindrical shell around the asteroid and spray material from the asteroid onto the cylinder, giving it some spin and artificial gravity to hold the material up or rather down to its surface. We spin the asteroid faster and faster until it flies apart, transferring its material and its angular momentum to the cylinder. With larger asteroids we send a series of cylinders past them in a chain, painting their interiors with the material we will turn into dirt later on, until we run out of asteroid. For full-blown minor planets and moons, which are much more massive but still fairly low in gravity and lacking in the atmosphere, we pump matter up tubes to high above the planetoid to fill freighters, get compacted into cannonballs to be launched elsewhere, or simply pumped into rotating habitats being built nearby. And we are well along in the disassembly process, the planet Mercury is already half consumed, in a few more generations it will be a distant memory. Perhaps our greatest accomplishment is the work underway at Jupiter and Saturn. We're now in the process of dismantling these worlds to harvest the resources. The largest machines humanity has ever built, fusion candles, have been deployed into the atmospheres of Jupiter and Saturn. 
These enormous machines scoop up raw hydrogen from Jupiter and run their fusion reactors. One side of the fusion candle fires downward, keeping the machine aloft. The other end blasts out into space, spewing material that can be harvested from orbit. Not only that, but these candles provide thrust, pushing Jupiter and Saturn slowly but steadily into safer, more useful orbits for our civilization. As we use up the hydrogen, their mass will decrease. Uranus and Neptune will follow slowly and further out in the solar system. Eventually, eons into the future, we will have dismantled them down to their cores. More than a dozen times the mass of Earth in rock and metal down at the core of Jupiter. More raw materials than any other place in the solar system. The long-awaited construction of our fully operational Dyson Swarm will finally begin. We'll miss the presence of Jupiter and Saturn in the solar system and remember them fondly, but humanity needs room to stretch its legs. Of course, as huge as the gas giants are compared to Earth, the Sun is far bigger, and contains not just hydrogen and helium, but thousands of planets worth of heavier elements, which are spread around the Sun, not just concentrated deep down. Trying to scoop matter off a star is much harder than out of a gas giant, though conveniently we can take advantage of all that energy the Sun is giving off to power our extraction. The material on the Sun is also ionized, so it reacts strongly to magnetic forces, and the Sun generates a massively powerful magnetic field too. In fact, our Sun ejects about a billion kilograms of matter a second as solar wind. We have a few ways to increase this flow and harvest it. The first is called Thermal Driven Outflow. We hover mirrors over the surface reflecting and concentrating light down on spots on the Sun's surface to heat it up and increase the mass being ejected. This kicks up an eruption much like a solar flare, feeding more solar wind. We then place a large ring of satellites around the Sun's equator, connected to each other by a stream of ionized particles generating a huge current, themselves running that stream off solar power. This ring creates a powerful magnetic field pushing outward toward the Sun's poles and sending the superheated matter in that direction. Hovering over the poles, further out, we have a giant ring sucking up sunlight and generating a huge toroidal magnetic field. All that matter we store up on the Sun and off the poles is sucked through that and slowed down for collection. It's a lot like the Vasimir Drive, using a magnetic nozzle so that nothing has to touch the ultra-hot plasma. Giant plasma thrusters essentially acting as the pump to gather matter, it stays in place using the momentum it's stealing from the particles it is slowing down. Again, it is a giant plasma thruster. We will eventually build far more of these rings around the Sun, spaced up and down from the equator, and intermittently shut off the power beam hoarding them aloft. As all the satellites in the ring drop, building up speed, we switch the power for the beam back on and their plummet stops, and they push back up to their original position. We do this with all the rings, in sequence, pushing much larger waves of matter toward the poles than the thermal driven outflow method provides, and we call this option the Huff and Puff method. And there you have it, our tips and techniques to harvest all the resources from the solar system. To push and pull worlds, to heat them up, cool them down, and use their raw materials to house humanity's growing, ever-expanding population. As we nearly achieve our Type II civilization status, and control all the energy from our Sun and all the resources of the solar system, we set our sights on a new goal, doing the same thing for the entire Milky Way galaxy. Perhaps in a few million years, we'll create another guide for you to help you make this transition as efficiently as possible. Good luck. Now if you haven't already seen Part 1, take the link to that, and make sure to subscribe to both channels. I want to thank all the Patreon supporters for both channels for their continued support and for submitting the ideas for this episode and there were some great ones, at least half are already tentatively scheduled for future production. But special congratulations to Gannon Huding, who suggested this specific topic and who is also receiving one of Frasier's meteorites as an award. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to like it and share it with others. Until next time, thanks for watching and have a great week.